Right, welcome to this episode of Just One Thing. Today I'm going to walk you through or talk about the Windows Azure worker role. My name is Adam Gerholsky and I'm a technical evangelist with RBA Consulting. So what is a worker role? Well, um, first of all, it's, it's really just an executable, um, .NET 3.5, Service Pack 1 or 4.0. And it's focused on back-end processing, non-HTTP service hosting. In the previous episode of Just One Thing, we talked about the web role and how that's really kind of focused on HTTP, you know, service hosting, websites, etc. This is, by default, this is focused on back-end processing. So there are no publicly exposed endpoints, etc. Um, by default, it doesn't allow inbound connections. So you can actually host services in a worker role, but by default, there are no open ports to allow incoming connections. But if you wanted to host a WCF service in a worker role, you certainly could. There's just a few hoops you need to jump through to make that happen. But really, a worker role, I mean, these three points are fine, but the way to really help conceptualize or think about it is if you've done Windows service development in the past, it's that similar kind of model. Well, I want, I want a service running somewhere that does some kind of processing for me. That's all a worker role is really meant to do. So maybe it's analyzing insurance data. Maybe it's encoding video. Maybe you're slicing and dicing image files. It's, it's really meant for kind of that high CPU utilization process. In terms of the programming model, there are some things to note here. It's very similar to a Windows service, as I just said, and it starts up once it gets deployed and will get stopped when required. What it does, it inherits this class called role entry point, and actually the web role does as well. But you have an on start method that allows you to perform some initialization tasks. You can override it if you want to. So you can, um, you know, if there's some diagnostic information you want to set up and start capturing, you can certainly do that here. Um, and until the on start returns true, um, this will just report back to the load balancer that it's busy, which means the load balancer won't route any traffic to this particular, to the instance until it's actually completed with on start, or that it reports uh, true. Then the, the key thing to note um, with this is the run method. So each worker role has a run method that's part of it from the it inherits from role entry point. And this is where your logic goes. So if you're monitoring a queue, you're kicking off a process, it happens here. The thing to note is that um, when you create a worker role, it actually um, in the, it creates a run method for you and puts an infinite loop in there. You need that infinite loop. You might not think it's a good idea, but you actually need it. Um, because if you exit the loop, then your role will shut down. So a role is not much good if it's not actually running. And finally, there's also an on stop method um, you can use. Uh, you can override uh, if the role is going to be shut down. Uh, it could be shut down for any number of reasons. Maybe I should say if the instance is going to be shut down. Uh, maybe the rack where this instance is hosted is is bad, so the the, the fabric controller is going to move that instance somewhere else. The on stop method will get called, but keep in mind uh, it gives you the ability to exit gracefully. So maybe do any kind of cleanup, disposal of resources, but you only have 30 seconds to do it if if you're not able to clean up in 30 seconds, your instance will just get stopped automatically. So keep that in mind. You can't do a whole lot in that time period. It's just meant to kind of hopefully just clean things up really quickly and then get out. In terms of uh, the patterns or how do you actually use a work role, there are kind of three common patterns that go along with it. First is kind of a queue polling worker. When we talk about Windows Azure storage in a fu future episode, we'll talk about queues. Um, but if you've used MSMQ or other queuing mechanisms, you already kind of know what they are. And the idea here is that as the worker rolls running, it's pulling a queue every so often and, and popping messages off that queue and doing some kind of work based on based on that message. So a common example would be the map reduce pattern where a message gets dropped on a queue about doing some background image processing. The worker role picks up the message and does whatever image processing it needs to do. Similarly, you could or you could also have a listening worker role. I talked about um, on one of the first slides about how to, by default um, there are no inbound connections allowed, but you can certainly allow inbound connections to host a WCF service if you wanted to have a TCP listener. So this could just host a service and then just wait for requests to come into it. And those requests um, would be load balanced as well by load balancer. When we talked about web roles, we talked about how all requests to a web role is load balanced. The same would be the case here with worker roles. If you're hosting a WCF service and you have these publicly facing endpoints, those will get load balanced for you by Azure as well. Finally, you can have an external process worker role. Maybe maybe you've got some executable you want to bundle up with your worker role or you've got something you want to run in the background. Well, it's simple enough just to call process.start, so something you, you're 
you may be used to using in other tasks or, or other development practices, um, just to kick off an external process and, and let that thing run. Um, what you can do, if it, if it happens to be an application you're running, you can use a feature called Startup Task to install uh, the process uh, as, as the instance startup. And then once the instance is started, just you know, map out to the executable and call process.start so you can run it. So this gives you a lot of different options. You could run a custom database server if you wanted to, your own web server. Maybe you want to run, you know, a non-IIS web server. You could use a worker role to do that. If you wanted to use the distributed cache, you don't want to use the caching service that's provided as part of Windows Azure App Fabric. You could run your own distributed cache. A popular option here is memcache. So lots and lots of different options for worker roles to do all kinds of processing for you. So let's take a look at what uh, worker role implementation actually looks like. It's got Visual Studio up and running here. We'll create another new Windows Azure project. I think I'm on 12 now. Oh, 13, as a matter of fact. Okay. Well, hopefully that's not unlucky. Create the project. And this time, um, what I've done in some of the previous episodes is created a web role. I'm going to create a worker role. And I'll just call it my worker role. And let's, let's take a look at what's going on here. Click OK. So let's give me my Azure project, and then I have my worker role. And the worker role just has one class in it by default, and that's worker role. You'll notice it does inherit from that role entry point I talked about before. And let's take a little look at that, what that does. So first is the, um, well, let's not look at the run method first. So we have unstart here. Um, I can, this code just gets generated for you. You can change the default connection limit if you want to. Um, but what you can also do in on start, and we'll have another episode on diagnostics, is to configure some diagnostic information. So what kind of metrics do I want to capture? Are there performance counters I want to add? What do, what do I want to do here? Um, how often do I want to ship diagnostic data to a durable store to get it off the local disk, etc. So once on start returns true, um, you can, you'll start running, and that'll actually occur in the obviously the run method. So and here's this infinite loop I was talking about this while true you see here. So this gets generated for you. Don't get rid of this. Whatever you do, do not get rid of the while true. If you do that, if you don't have this infinite loop in place and you exit run, then you'll get to the on stop method. So your, your role will essentially be done. And you'll see they've given you a sample implementation. Obviously, you know, you don't want it, you don't need to do thread.sleep and the trace.write line. Just gives you a place to start. But this is where, um, if we were using that queue polling worker pattern, we could do that right here. So now if I run this, now it's very important to note here, oh, let's get the emulator up and running once again, or the UI I should say. So as this runs, there's obviously no UI associated with it. Oops, sorry, there we go. So you'll see here it's actually starting up and I'm getting a bunch of diagnostic data coming in. And you'll see here this says information working. So what, where that's coming from, if I come back to here, so every time it, it goes through this loop and it sleeps, but then it gets, uh, it writes out a message called working. So it sees trace.writeline. So that's just a common diagnostic tool that you've probably used in other apps. However, to make that work in Azure, and this applies to web roles too, but since we're in the worker role, we can talk about it just a little bit. Let's go back to the compute emulator. See, it's run through a couple more times. So we can close this. We'll stop debugging here. So in order to hook up that trace listener, and it's very handy when debugging, especially in the cloud, so you can see what's going on. This gets wired up for you automatically. So if I go to my worker role, you'll see here, First thing in my configuration, we've talked about .NET trust level and instances. It's also, do I want to capture diagnostics? So that's the first part of me being able to capture this trace information, enabling diagnostics. Now, one thing to point out here, like I said, I think earlier we'll have another episode devoted to diagnostics. But by default, this sets up to use development storage equals true. So it's storing all this diagnostic data in your local development store, which you'll remember is in uh, that SQL Server Express database on your machine. Before you deploy to the cloud, you need to make sure you update this to an actual Windows Azure storage account. If you don't, you will not, your role won't fail, it won't blow up, but you won't get any diagnostic information because development storage doesn't exist in a production environment and it probably shouldn't. So, but anyway, so capturing diagnostics here, 
running locally. The other thing that gets wired up for you, if you take a look at your app config, and this also happens in the web config of, of the web role, is that you get a listener wired up. So it's part of this, it's in the diagnostics, assembly, diagnostic, monitor, trace listener. And it gets wired up for you. So that way, anytime I do trace.write line and I'm running in this Windows Azure environment, it'll get written out. And in this case, the emulator will pick it up so I can kind of see the messages as, as they're going across. And I can obviously filter it out as well. So just a handy little feature to be aware of as well. Of course, it goes with the worker roles, but you can also use this feature in the web roles too. And that's really it. So worker roles, are, there's not a whole lot to them. Um, most of the logic that's involved with the worker role is the logic specific to your application. So, and it's really what you put in that run method in, in that infinite loop, uh, whatever you get started. Um, but basically, you can do anything you want. If it can run in Windows Server 2008, SP2 or greater, you could do it in a worker role if you needed to. So hopefully that kind of gets you thinking about worker roles um, and how you can use them in your applications.